and let me share the screen. So do you have any idea how many degree of freedom of the second example? Again, we, we begin with the, the coordinate that we think it can describe the motion of each component in the system. We have the X coordinate that describe the position of the mass M1. And we have the Y coordinate that describe the position of the mass M2. And we have the theta that describe the rotation of the pulley. And in this case, the special thing that is increased from the previous problem is, hey, we have the spring that are added to the system. So when we have the spring here, when we have the spring here, we cannot write down the, the constraint equation as the previous problem. We cannot write down, we cannot say that, hey, x, equal to r2 theta. We cannot say like that. We cannot say y equal to r1 theta. We cannot write down this constraint equation anymore. So the three coordinates are independent, are independent. The theta don't have the, the geometric constraint with X. The theta don't have geometric constraint with Y. X and Y don't have geometric constraint. And we need three degree of freedom to describe the motion of the whole system. We need the generalized coordinate X to describe the motion of mass one. We need the generalized coordinate Y to describe the motion of mass two. And we need the generalized coordinate theta to describe the rotation of the pulley. So the answer is we have three degree of freedom and these three variable are the set of generalized coordinate for the three degree of freedom system. How about this example? How about this example? How many degree of freedom? One. Uh, thank you, Lawisha. La uh, this system have one degree of freedom. And I hope you can guess what should be the generalized coordinate for this one degree of freedom system. In this system, we have the wall and have a hinge joint here, the level root joint, and the bar can rotate about this level root joint. And we have the theta that describe how much 
the bar rotate far away from the horizontal line. So the generalized coordinate is the angle theta for this case. How about this? We have a bar that put on two spring. We have a bar that put on two spring. Do you think how many degree of freedom of this system? They try to use X. They try to use X to describe the vertical displacement of the center of gravity G. And they use theta to describe the inclination of the bar. How many degree of freedom? Two. Yes, two degree of freedom. And the generalized coordinate are X that describe the vertical displacement of the center of gravity G and the theta that describe the inclination of the system. If you don't like this, if you don't like X and don't like theta, of course you may define x1 and x2 to describe the vertical displacement to describe the vertical displacement at the left and the right point of the spring connected point but The two set of generalized coordinate, the two set of generalized coordinate can be related by the geometric constraint. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see like at this point, the vertical displacement is X and we have angle theta, angle theta. So X1 is equal to X. It's, it's depend on the it depends on the direction. Let me make it clear. Let me make it clear. X is measured positive in the downward direction and theta is positive in the clockwise direction. So, X, X2 X1 If we are going to use X1 and X2 as a generalized coordinate as a generalized coordinate the geometric the relationship is x1 is equal to x subtract by the half of the length multiplied by the angle x2 is bigger than x plus by the half of the length multiplied by the theta. So of course we know we have two degree of freedom, but you still have some alternatives to define the generalized coordinate 
from the picture, we can see, we, we already see X and theta as generalized coordinate. But if you only have the picture and nobody assign X and theta for you, you still have choice to describe it by X1 and X2. Also for this example, for this example, you may describe the system by X that describe the vertical displacement of the endpoint. And of course, we have the geometric constraint to relate x equal to L theta for the small angle assumption. How about this one, the last one, this one. We have mass. Do you think how many degree of freedom of this? We can see X1, right? X1 describe the linear displacement of mass one. And X2 fully describe the vertical position of mass M2. Until now, it seems like we have two degree of freedom. Should we, do we need to add another generalized coordinate to describe the rotation of pulley or not, should we? It seems like if we know the parameter of the pulley, we can derive the geometric constraint between the mass M1 and the theta of the pulley. So we don't need this theta as the additional generalized coordinate. We need only X1 and X2 to fully describe the position of the component M1 and M2 in the system. So in this case, the number of degree of freedom is two and the generalized coordinate X1 and X2 is enough. The, the types of vibration system, the types of vibration system, we can categorize by the number of degree of freedom in the previous slide, we are already familiar with how to count the number of degree of freedom. If the system have only one degree of freedom like this, only one degree of freedom, the vibration will be the vibration of a single degree of freedom system. If we have more than one degree of freedom, more than one degree of freedom, like this, like this, like this. It's the vibration of multiple degree of freedom system. In the real world application, in the real world application, if we cannot have the point mass like this, the point mass like this, but we have a continuous bar that have distributed mass. It's a continuous system. 
and it have infinite degree of freedom and we need we may sometimes need to use the computational way or have the mathematical model to to deal with that kind of problem in our class we mainly focus on this but not for the continuous system and already mentioned about the source of the vibration if we have the spring and mass system if we have the spring and mass system and we just pull it from equilibrium so that we pull it from equilibrium so that it have x zero and then it vibrate against time it vibrate against time this type of problem when we just apply the initial displacement initial condition but we don't have force applied during the vibration we call free vibration will be the effect of the initial condition for the force vibration we need to consider if the force is periodic force if the force is a kind of step force step means it's going to be zero and it's going to be one value at one point of time the step or maybe it can be the ram function at time t zero the force is equal to a constant multiplied by time ram here are a kind of trans transient input we also have the random vibration when we cannot model the form of the input and we cannot model the form of the input and when we talk about the energy dissipator if we have only have the spring and the mass in the system we don't have damper the oscillation uh, like continue forever but if we have a damper in the system it's a kind of energy dissipator it throw energy out from the system and the vibration will stop at one certain time it's the kind of the damp vibration for the damp vibration we also need to we need to spend maybe one to two weeks for the topic of the damp vibration sometimes we have too big damp coefficient sometimes we have so small damp coefficient and it affect the different characteristic of the system for example if the system uh, if the system have only spring it's gonna vibrate uh, let's talk about the the step input should be should be simple should be easier the step input means hey you have one spring mass system you have one spring mass system you have one spring mass system before time equal to t zero 
the force the force equal to zero when time equal to zero we apply the force one unit one newton maybe one newton so if we plot the displacement x varying against time if we plot displacement x varying against time what do we expect to see we know that the spring need to change its equilibrium if force is equal to one newton and for example if we know k equal to one newton per meter we may assume that the delta x may equal to one meter so if you plot the response of this vibration if you plot the response of this vibration when time equal to zero the spring doesn't move when time before t equal to zero the spring doesn't move but when time equal to zero you apply force one newton to the mass connected to the spring one newton per meter of course it seems like the spring may have the new equilibrium point. The spring may have the new equilibrium point. And that equilibrium point needs to be one meter because we have one Newton and the K is one Newton per meter. It means that if you pull it with one Newton, the spring need to move to the right hand side one meter, deviate from the original equilibrium. But it's not stopped at one meter. You may have some point that over shoot the equilibrium the new equilibrium one meter you will overshoot to one maximum value to the right hand side and then you still maintain the one newton but spin go over the new equilibrium point if you have the force that pull it back to the new equilibrium and it will backward and forward again and continue to vibrate if the system don't have a damper, if the system don't have a damper, it will continue vibrate like this forever. If the system have a damper with a good value of the, the damping coefficient, you may see the response You may see the response like this go over the equilibrium and track the new equilibrium and no more vibration with a good value of the damper Okay, continue. And if you have the damper that is very big value, what we expect to see is if, if you have the value of very big damper, what we expect to see is the Imagine that you have maybe a very strong shock absorber connected 
here. And you apply the step of force to pull the system. If we don't have the damper, it continue vibrate. If we have a small value of the damping coefficient, it go over the equilibrium, come back, and finally it stop vibrate because the damper throw the energy out. If the value of the damping coefficient is very high, we are gonna see another different type of response. It's gonna go slowly to track the design new equilibrium, no overshoot and no vibration. But but it may take a very, very long time to track the new equilibrium. So yeah, many times we need to trade off between, we need to trade off between the, the value of the damper that let's add go to the desired new equilibrium faster, but allow it to have a feel overshoot and then track the equilibrium or have a very big damping coefficient to guarantee that it's not gonna vibrate, but it may take a very, very long time to achieve the desired deflection that we want. It depends on the application that we need. Okay. And if we consider the equation of motion, the equation like mx dot dot plus kx equal to zero, you can see that x have only the second time derivative and x with this we call the linear equation of motion. But if you have some high of m psi, Theta, something like that, equal to maybe F. If the term is not just a theta, but it's in the term of the, the trigonometric function, it's gonna be nonlinear. You may try to linearize this equation by like M theta, something like that when, when you assume the small angle assumption. Yeah, this, this equation is not a good example. You should have a kind of at least, at least k theta. Yeah, it should be in the same domain. I'm sorry. K theta, torsional stiffness theta and torque, something like that. And many times, many times, if you see mx square, for example, like this, it's nonlinear equation. But if you have only x, x dot, x dot, dot, theta, theta dot, theta dot, dot, it's linear equation. In this class, we only focus on linear equation. If it's a kind of the nonlinear system, we will try to linearize so that we can have the linear equation. And let's review the idea of the simple harmonics. That's the idea of simple harmonics. When we see this, when we see this, uh, or sinusoidal, you, you, you can describe the displacement here by the magnitude, by the magnitude, magnitude. 
and psi function of omega t plus the phase angle omega t plus the phase angle so the omega can be obtained from the period of the signal if you see here i think you can see the period of the signal is some value numerical value i also don't know but this is the period from this period we can obtain the omega we can obtain the omega and if we talk about the frequency of the vibration if we talk about the frequency of the vibration the relationship is omega is equal to 2 pi f yeah you can derive to get the frequency omega equal to 2 pi per period and another important thing in this slide is we may familiar with write down the response in terms of the magnitude the omega and the phase chip that tell you how much the how much the response different from the original psi function without the phase chip but what i want to say is what i want to say is or simple harmonic response can be composed from two signal cosine and psi signal without the phase chip without the phase chip now we have phase chip but we can write down this one without the phase chip so the relationship is the relationship is from the original signal we're gonna apply the psi of a plus b is equal to psi a cos b plus psi b cos a psi b apply this property so here gonna be psi omega t cos phi and plus cos omega t psi phi i try to separate the term that is not in the terms of time t so we have x cos phi as a coefficient and multiply by psi omega t and we have x psi phi and multiply by cos of omega t so yeah this one can be b this one can be a because it's gonna be a constant a constant the phi angle is a constant angle x magnitude is also a constant so we can have the constant a and b and yeah now a is equal to x psi phi b 
is x cosine phi. So a, a square plus b square is equal to x square and sine square phi plus cosine square phi equal to one. So you, you, you can relate the magnitude from this form to the A and B magnitude of the separate cosine and psi component. And also the angle phi, the angle phi here can also be obtained from this relationship. So yeah, in this slide it's nothing important, but just like, when we, when we need to relate the two form of function, the one we have the phi angle inside the sinusoidal function. Another one, we try to eliminate the phi, but we separate the component to sine and cosine function with the same omega. And how about the review, the kinematics, the kinematics? Uh, actually, you should review the class dynamics that you study, but in this slide, have a few concepts from the kinematic of a particle that I think is important and it can help you when you need to derive something. Uh, we have the center of motion at point A and the radius of the traveling part R. So the position vector, the position vector of this particle is described by the magnitude R and the unit vector in n direction. Unit vector in n direction means we have i n in this direction and we have i t in this direction. i n is normal to the velocity. i t is the direction of the, the velocity. So R position vector is equal to magnitude R multiplied by the unit vector I n. Velocity vector, velocity vector is equal to the first time derivative. of the position vector. So the first time derivative of the position vector, you need to have the d by dt of the magnitude r, while you keep the direction i n. And you maintain, you maintain the magnitude r why you obtain the first time derivative of the unit vector of the unit vector. So do you have any idea about obtain the time derivative of the unit vector? Uh, in this picture, we have the unit vector i n, the unit vector of the direction of n or the normal direction. And this unit vector make the theta with the horizontal direction. When the time pass, when the time pass, 
i n change the direction to i n plum and the angle changed by the theta the this the the distance here the direction here is perpendicular is perpendicular the direction that perpendicular to the i n the unit vector of the normal the direction that perpendicular to the unit vector of normal is the direction of the tangential or the direction of the velocity so this direction this direction is the direction of it it what should be the magnitude here what should be the magnitude here the unit vector i n has the magnitude of one the length of the vector the length of the vector is one the angle at the center is d theta so the distance here this vector have the distance of one multiplied by the theta with the direction i t d theta in the direction of tangential direction unit vector d by dt uh, this one is delta of delta of i n delta of i n delta of i n is equal to i n subtract by no no delta of i n is i n plum subtract by i n the new unit vector of normal direction the old unit vector of normal direction the different is the vector here and this vector can be composed from the angle at the center multiplied by the radius which is the magnitude of unit vector one and the direction will be direction that normal to the i n the direction will be the i t so here here we come back to here we may have if we change the radius in the direction of i n it will be in the effect of the radius change and the effect of the directional change will be d i n by d t but d i n equal to d theta i t so it's gonna be d theta by d t in the direction of i t so r dot i n plus r theta dot i t okay in this slide it may not directly relate to what we are going to study in this class maybe it's not in the exam okay in this slide but just to review the concept of dynamics for you so the velocity consists of two components the first component is the change of the radius when we have r dot the second component is the change effect of the change in direction or the velocity in the tangential velocity in this picture 
r dot equal to zero, we have constant radius. So we only can see this one here. If you want to see the acceleration, we continue dip of the velocity vector by time. And of course, the velocity vector is this one. So you need to do like r dot dot i n plus r dot i n dot. And this term gonna be r dot theta dot plus r theta dot dot i t and plus by r theta dot i t dot it will be yeah a few more complicated you know how to have the i n dot but here you need to know how to obtain the i t dot by using the same concept and summarize all the form so review what you learn from dynamic class and okay from this slide it's gonna be the basic that we need in our class the newton second laws of motion can be for the linear motion summation of force equal to ma of the center bar means at cg bar means at cg summation of force equal to mass multiplied by the acceleration vector of the center of gravity for here summation of moment about cg summation of moment about point G is equal to I bar and alpha. Again, I bar is the moment of inertia about CG. This is useful for a kind of general plane motion that we need to consider the effect of the rotation about CG. But if we have a fixed axis rotation, we can if we have a fixed axis rotation we can consider m about any point fixed axis rotation point and the moment of inertia also about that point alpha we will be going into detail about how to obtain the equation of motion again but we have two possible way to obtain the equation of motion. The first way is from the Newton second law of motion, summation of F equal to MA or summation of moment equal to I alpha. Another way is obtained from the energy, work energy equation. For the work energy equation, I hope you still remember the kinetics energy. The kinetics energy is the energy stored by inertia property as the effect of motion. When we increase the velocity at CG, and increase the omega about CG, we increase the kinetic energy. In this case, it's useful for general plane motion when the CG change the position and we change the rotation about the CG. But if we have a fixed axis, rotation, we may only consider the moment of inertia about that fixed axis. 
and consider the kinetic energy only as the effect of the rotation about that fixed axis. For general plane motion, it's a body, it's a body that travel with velocity and also rotate with omega. And potential energy, potential energy, we have the spring potential energy. I hope you still remember for the linear spring. For the torsion spring, potential energy is equal to one per two of torsional stiffness. And theta actually actually i always i always use delta to confirm that is the distance measure from the equilibrium point of the spring equilibrium angle equilibrium position of the spring potential energy also include the the height the height and the principle of work and energy is the kinetic energy at the initial state plus by the work done by non-conservative force. The initial energy plus by the work done by non-conservative force will equal to the total energy at the final state. Okay, and the work done by non-conservative force, yeah, from point A to B is the integral of force vector dot the position vector from RA to RB. Or the integral of moment D theta Reveal from the dynamics class, but for today we have few easy problem, very easy problem, to make you clear. How can we obtain the equation of motion? How can we obtain the equation of motion? We have only two slide before we end the today class. It may take more ten minutes, so <laughs> please pay attention. We have a spring. We have a spring with stiffness K and we have mass M and the one degree of freedom is described by the generalized coordinate X. It's gonna be on the floor, frictionless floor. So to obtain the equation of motion, the first step we need to do is draw the free body diagram of the mass in a shear. If it moves to the right hand side along the positive direction of the generalized coordinate, the spring force will be on the left hand side, will be point to the left hand side if we go to the right hand side by x, force will be to the left hand side direction, kx. We have the normal force, we have the mg. We don't have any external force here. We don't have any external force here. Okay, 
the equation of motion by the method of the Newton laws summation fx equal to max summation fx equal to max summation fx minus kx equal to m x dot dot so finally the equation of motion m x dot dot plus k x equal to zero this is from the newton Newton's second law. How about from the energy points of will? The energy points of will. The kinetic energy plus the potential energy need to be constant need to be constant why in this case we don't have we don't have force non we don't have work done by non conservative force we don't have work done by non conservative force because external force is zero we have only mg and we don't have friction and normal force don't create any displacement so work is zero so the energy the energy here, what is the kinetic energy? Kinetic energy is one per two mv square, mv square. One per two mv square is kinetic energy. What is the potential energy in this case? The potential energy is one per two k delta x square delta x is x subtract by zero because we set the equilibrium position the data point we set the data point at the equilibrium position of the spring so delta x is equal to x so the elastic potential energy it's this one. And these are the total energy. We know that we know that the total energy never change against time. The total energy always constant. So the d by dt of the total energy, the d by dt of the total energy Can you obtain the first time derivative of the total energy? Consider the first term. We have one per two. Mass is a constant. D by dt of x dot square gonna be two x dot. And d by dt of x dot square is going to be 2x dot and d by dt of x dot, which is going to be x dot dot. Can, do, do you get this? d by dt of x dot square is equal to 2x dot d by dt of x dot. So finally, it's equal to 2x dot x dot dot, isn't it? The second term, 
d by dt of 1 per 2 kx square d by dt of 1 per 2 kx square is equal to 1 per 2 k constant 2 x and x dot equal to what do we have here we have m x dot dot plus Uh, mx dot dot kx wait 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 <laughs> yes 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 I'm sorry <laughs> okay thank you thank you very much <laughs> okay like this right we we have the common terms x Okay, and we know that, we know that this one is constant. So d by dt of this one need to equal to zero. So yeah, finally we have mx dot dot plus kx equal to zero. So the equation of motion obtained from the Newton's second laws of motion or the one that obtained from the work and energy theorem, we have the same results. We have the same results. Okay, here is the last example. When we consider the effect of the gravity, when we consider the effect of the gravity, be remember, Gravity is also conservative force. Gravity is also conservative force. We set the generalized coordinate Y here. We set the generalized coordinate Y. And when we draw the free body diagram, when we draw the free body diagram, we have a mass. We have mg and if we push the spring upward, if we push the spring upward with the positive y in upward direction, if we use our hand to push the spring upward with the positive y direction, the spring will create the downward force with the magnitude of k y. So the Newton's law of motion summation f y equal to m a y. When the positive is upward. So we have minus ky minus mg equal to m y dot dot. So here we rearrange the term. We have m y dot dot plus ky equal to minus mg from the Newton's method. How about from the work and energy method? What are the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of the system? What are the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of the system? The kinetic energy gonna be one per two m y dot square one per two mv square one per two m y dot square the potential energy consists of elastic 
and gravitational potential energy. The elastic potential energy depends on the deformation of the spring. In this case, delta y is equal to y subtract by zero. We set the datum at the spring neutral length spring neutral length so the elastic potential energy one per two ky square how about the gravitational potential energy with respect to the datum point here, if we increase the level by y, mgy, here is the total energy at a certain time, total energy at a certain time. So in this case, no, non-conservative. force, we don't have the non-conservative force here. So d by dt of the total energy, d by dt of the total energy need to be equal to zero. The total energy, the total energy need to be a constant because we don't have the non-conservative force. Okay, d by dt of this term, one per two m two y dot y dot dot plus one per two k y y dot plus m constant g constant y dot equal to zero so we are going to remove uh, y dot from all the terms so again, we have my dot dot plus uh, ky equal to minus mg as the uh, equation of motion here. Uh, actually, when we have the input force, and the input force is a non-conservative force. Uh, should I change the color? Wait a second. I don't know where to change the, no, 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 no. Okay. If we have the non-conservative force F, if we have the non-conservative force F, make it easy, like just a constant F, a constant F. What if we need to add the F to the free body diagram? If we need to add the F to the free body diagram, F gonna be here. And here. And for the for the work, uh, for the work, uh, the the right hand side need to be the right hand side need to be 
d by dt of the work done by the force f fy and if the force is constant if the force is constant magnitude force we're going to have fy dot here and cancel y and we're going to have f on the right hand side here for for another simple case when we have constant magnitude force non-conservative force we're gonna have f in the free body diagram in the upward direction and the equation of motion will be this one from the newton second laws method and for the energy method for the energy method dy dt on the the right hand side gonna be the work done by the non-conservative force and d by dt okay so we we have some point to focus on here i want you to see this are depend on the system parameter m and k mass and stiffness and the variable will be x dot dot and x if we don't have the force if we don't have the force in this system on the right hand side it's going to be zero if we have the force in the system the force input will appear on the right hand side here the left hand side still remain the same okay i think this is too much for today almost 4 p.m ah uh, thank you for your attention <laughs> do you have any question i received your name list in email and i will hurry create the the class in the Moodle and let you know when it's ready. So I will upload the course syllabus, the lecture slides for all the class and also the Zoom record. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording for today. <laughs>